I'll call the Wednesday, January 26th meeting of the Public Safety Committee meeting to order. Um, staff, please call the roll. Um, I'll entertain a motion on the minutes of November 24th. Make a motion to approve them. Second. Any additions, changes, modifications? If not, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Post minutes are approved. Um, I don't have any, we left the street safety thing on. I may take it off, but because um, we did that during Winnequa, but unless anybody has anything to add to that, we'll skip down to new business. Uh, we'll Madam Chair, if I can. Yes, Chief. Um, I would just like to uh, make mention in regards to this topic of uh, street safety for cars, bikes, and pedestrians that uh, the Dane County Traffic Safety Commission has asked to conduct a public listing session uh, for the city of Monona in regards to traffic safety, in particular as it, result, as it uh, relates to the traffic survey that uh, they put out uh, late, late last year. Uh, the results are in and they would like us to host a listening session uh, for members of our community uh, with respect to uh, the results of that survey, but as well as talking about uh, some of the focus areas uh, that the community may have interest in with respect to traffic safety. And then um, uh, uh, we, Public Works uh, Director and I, uh, agreed to take part in talking about what the city has done or has uh, planned uh, in the works. And so, the request is for that listing session to be held at the February 23rd meeting of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, Director Safani has agreed that uh, public safety was the best place for that, and he will invite members of Public Works to attend that uh, session. If that's okay, that, that's terrific. Um, we. Um, if we're going to do it, we probably want to get some announcements out. And so um, we can, do you want to do some, or, or I mean, does the police department want to do some announcements on VMO? Yes, the, the traffic safety uh, commission already has templates. We're one of 14 different communities that are doing this or have done it. And so uh, they already have sort of, uh, what they call recruitment uh, announcements, uh, templates for those announcements that I will be using for both social media as well as via, uh, as the radio station. Um, and make sure somebody posts it on the city website. Yes, ma'am. And um, maybe we could ask um, the library and, and the rec department and the senior department have fairly large email newsletters that they could send a bulletin out, as well as if there is a pamphlet, um, the school district sends home, um, they, they allow you for things of community interest, they allow you to send things home in, in, with the, in the students' backpacks. So if they have an announcement, um, we can, um, arranged to have it sent home in the children's backpack, which given the fact that we have a lot of students that walk in this um, in this district and they are interested in safety, it might be good to include the young families of the community. Okay, I've got all that uh, written down, thank you. Okay, does anybody else have any other suggestions? Well, just I, I think that the chief will uh, will allow us to put it in the February newsletter. Yep, yep. Uh, city newsletter as well. Got that. Thank you. And if you send it out to all the alders, somehow we we sometimes get omitted on announcements like that. So if you send it out to all the alders, we can push it out to our social networks as well. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, anything else on that? Thank you, Chief. Um, we'll now move down to new business um, discussion, action on uh, a conversation with um, Maple Bluff Fire Department about providing EMS services via contract. Chief McMillan. Good evening, everybody. 
uh, this is just an informational point, so you're not uh, hearing about it third hand. I was uh, approached uh, about a month and a half ago by the, the Maple Bluff Fire Chief to sit down and have some conversations on if we could provide some mutually beneficial um, services to each other. Uh, currently, their EMS is provided by Ryan Brothers via contract. Um, we're about seven minutes from their uh, village limits from our station. And we're the closest uh, alternative other than the city of Madison. So um, Chief uh, William reached out to me along with Chief Loy, sat down, had some initial conversations. It hasn't progressed further than that yet. I'm gonna reach out to them in, in writing basically to make it a little bit more formal. Let's sit down and see what uh, the village of Maple Bluff is looking for. Uh, I just wanted to give you a heads up that that conversation is occurring. So if you hear it uh, outside of here that uh, you understand that it's not a rumor, we actually are talking with Maple Bluff. Uh, very beginning stages, nothing um, more than uh, an expressed interest at this point, but I wanted to make sure you're all aware of it before it uh, goes any more formal than that. So I'm off also the, happy to answer questions. Off the top of your head. How do you feel about it? And do you think it's likely to happen or not likely to happen? I would come down on the side of it's probably a little bit more likely to happen than not. Uh, I think it's a, a good benefit to both departments. Uh, they currently have 27 staff, uh, volunteers and full-time. All of them are licensed, both fire and EMS. Uh, so all of them have an EMS license as a requirement to, to be on their department. So there's a lot of benefit um, to provide some cross credentialing and some uh, uh, cross department cooperation to be able to provide additional staffing both on our extra ambulance and they're already coming mutual aid for structure fire calls anyway. So we already we're already collaborating on training and some other issues. So um, it was a logical step for the chief to reach out and, and see if we were interested. I'm interested enough to have a conversation and see where it goes. I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of it before I officially have a conversation with him. Oh, I did. Sounds interesting. Does anybody Chief, have any questions? Yeah, Chief, the idea is that they would respond out of Monona or would they be doing overnight out of Maple Bluff? Um, it would probably be on a case by case basis. So if we, we would generally, if we have extra staffing to send 62 up on a call, uh, if we have one, they would have somebody on scene already that would be licensed with us to hop on and make a legal ambulance crew to, to transport, um, but also to provide us additional staffing in Monona if needed um, for a second ambulance call. There's a lot of really exciting possibilities with this that uh, both of us were interested enough to sit down and explore and see if it's something that we can get over the, the hurdles with to, to do something formal with. Sounds good. Chief? Any other questions? Yeah, I got a couple of questions. Chief, when I read this, a couple of things occurred to me. Well, number one, they get ambulance coverage from uh, Ryan Brothers. And is there somehow an issue with that coverage? The other question that came to my mind was uh, response time. I had no idea that the response time from here to Maple Bluff was as short as seven minutes. I thought it would be maybe twice that. Uh, but I guess when you got a red light and a siren and a heavy foot. Well, I can tell you when I drove up there to meet with them last month about some other um, uh, collaborative things and this, and this discussion came up, I made it from the Monona Fire Station to the Maple Bluff Fire Station in eight minutes driving non-emergent. Well, I want to know lights. what route you take. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> up, up, up Atwood to, to First Street and around that way. It was, it was a total of eight minutes from start to finish. So now I, I will say I did round down. It might've been eight minutes and 15 seconds, but it was about eight minutes on the clock anyway. So, so I guess those are two questions that came to my mind. Um, um, there, there, are, there are some concerns, I believe, currently with the, the way the coverage they have. Currently, the coverage for Maple Bluff comes from the Ryan Brothers Station on Park Street. So it's a considerable uh, response time into Maple Bluff, which is why they require all their folks to be licensed uh, basics and advanced EMTs. Um, what it provides to them is some additional opportunities to not only provide initial patient care, but continue that patient care to the hospital if they choose to. That if they're cross-credential with us, they can hop on the ambulance and continue patient care all the way to the hospital. 
we see the benefit of extra revenue uh, from billing. Um, it will not be a lot of revenue. Um, I believe uh, last year they had 53 EMS calls. So it's not a not an extreme call burden on us, uh, more of a neighborly thing we can do that might also generate a little bit of extra revenue for us and some better coverage for our second ambulance. Do they also get mutual aid from Madison if needed? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank Thanks for the update, Chief. Um, we will move on to item B, discussion action on current AFG grant for SCUBA for SCBA update on progress. This will be a real quick update. Uh, just wanted to let you guys know where it's at. Uh, we ordered the SCBA back in December. Um, we were billed for them at that point. Uh, the bill has been paid by the federal government. They've reimbursed us the $198,000. Um, and then our $10,000 share was paid as well. Uh, so as of this week, they're paid for. They are in transit. They should actually be in the station either late this week or early next week. So we're actually going to be starting to train on them the first week in February. Um, taking a short break, I believe the second week in February for somebody else to, to train with us. Um, our own Larry Reed uh, doing some training with us, but uh, we're going to be hopefully getting them on the trucks by March 1st. So that's the goal at this point. It may get pushed to April 1st, but uh, depending on the arrival of everything in the training, uh, but they should be here momentarily. Good. Any questions? Well, Chief, you're on a roll. So let's go down to item <laughs> C, discussion action to consider increasing LTE wage from 18 to $20 an hour using existing budgeted amount. Yes, well, so there's some information in your packet. This is the only item I could added information on because I, I wanted to show my math, so to speak, to, to the teacher. Um, so currently in Dane County, the, the current average for LTEs for paramedics runs, uh, the, the lowest LTE wage currently is 20.50 an hour. Uh, except for us, we're at 18. Uh, and looking at that and trying to attract LTEs and get them to run with our service, we're also one of only two agencies in Dane County that require them to be fire certified as well. So we require extra certifications and we're also the lowest paid in Dane County. So when it comes to folks that are willing to provide casual coverage, we're pretty much at the bottom of the, of the barrel. They'll pick anybody else over us. If they have free time and nobody else wants them, they'll come run with us. Um, which I don't begrudge out of my LTEs. Um, they, they do casual time to get paid, so I, I understand that. So what I looked at is the number of hours that I get budgeted monthly is, I believe, 216 hours a month uh, is what it was based on in the budget. This first month of January, we lost my big LTE uh, hour grabber. He took a full-time job in Montana. So I'm left with about 160 hours of, of time that was allotted to January for LTE time. That right there accounts for a dollar an hour for the rest of the year uh, with, the, uh, with the amount of time that I've got allotted per month. What I did then is took a look at the 216 a month so, to see how many times we actually reached that amount, which is none to be frank with our LTEs. So I lowered that by another 12 hours a month. And by doing that, it gave me another dollar an hour. So it allows me to raise the LTE wage from its current $18 an hour to $20 an hour. Still provides us 204 hours a month of LTE coverage, um, but allows us to possibly attract and get a little bit more coverage from our existing LTEs. Uh, I'm working to bring one another LTE on this month. Um, but that's the, again, I wanted to include the documentation so you can check my formula and check my math and make sure that I'm, uh, that I took my shoes off for a good reason to do the addition and subtraction um, and also to answer questions. But I'm trying to get us to, within range of other uh, communities that use LTE paramedics. Um, we'll, we'll never be the top, but we should at least be within the average of, of Dane County. Yeah, what, what I would say that you should add in into your rationale is then I, I can't remember the last time I've gone into any retail store where I haven't seen a help wanted and I believe Walmart is at over $15 with benefits. And so the job market is so competitive these days. 
and the salaries, quite frankly, are going up. I mean, that that is what the market is. So are, are there other questions or comments? Do we all think this is a good idea? Does anybody not think it's a good idea? Um, do you want to motion? Me and I think you counted on your toes correctly. <laughs> That's good. I haven't lost my mind yet, which is good. So I tried to be creative, but stay within the, the existing budget. Do you um, want a motion? Do you want a motion to recommend this to the council? Uh, I believe so. I'm not sure what the steps are because it's within the existing budget. Uh, there's no budgetary impact. That's why I brought it here first. So I, th I think at, at, at a minimum, finance and personnel has to has to approve the, the wage rate. I, so, in which case, I would gladly accept the motion for a recommendation from the Public Safety Committee. I'd be delighted to make the motion. Second. First, second. Connie, um, discussion? I have a question. This is Connie. Um, is that amount, are we going to be able to get LTEs at that amount? Do you think we'll get the coverage we need? Or do we even need more? Uh, I think th this is a good start. What I'd like to do is see how that affects my LTE coverage over the next few months. And then by the time it works to budget time for next year, I should have a better idea whether we need to go up another dollar an hour or if this is something that's sustainable through the 23 budget year. So if I'm starting to see an increase in LTE coverage because we've done this, uh, if that's sustained over the next, uh, through June or July, when I start looking at my 23 budget, uh, if I'm getting additional coverage, then I think we're probably in a pretty good spot. Almost all the almost all the other agencies just raised their LTE wages. Most of them were floating around 20. Um, there's one at 2050. The other ones are around 21, 21.50 an hour. So um, going from 18 to 20, I think, is a big um, step, and also something that we can and that I will promote to our LTEs that this is a, a, a benefit provided from the city. Um, to thank them for coming and pulling time that they don't have to pull otherwise. So uh, I, I figure it'll sit for a few months and we'll see how we get for coverage. Sounds good. Okay, to follow up what Connie said, if you have trouble getting um, help at that rate, you need to come back to us. Although I suspect that most of them want to come to our beautiful fire station and work at it because it's <laughs> so heat of the art. Yes. But But I bet they love working for you, so... We, we have a good time. Everybody, everybody's having a good time. So are there any other, oh, we didn't vote, did we? Um, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, okay, we will move down to item E, um, discussion action on updates to Monona Police Canine Policy. Chief Cheney Austin. Yes, uh, thank you, Alder. Um, this was included in the packet. I'm looking for a uh, recommendation to council to approve the changes to our canine policy. I can tell you that um, in researching sort of the uh, what to include in our policy, uh, I found and, and our wonderful Lieutenant Weigel uh, noted to me other existing policies your chief of police wasn't even aware of uh, that uh, we had in writing somewhere here at the police department. So um, uh, I, I tried to incorporate the best of both worlds. I reached out to uh, my former colleagues at Madison who's, who've had a very long lasting uh, canine program that's been proven in, in court, et cetera, um, and uh, received their input. I took um, you know, some input from the public who had some concerns with respect to deployment of a patrol dog, dog uh, which I very much agreed with. So striking things such as uh, removing the ability or, or um, uh, removing uh, language that allowed canine teams to, to be deployed for crowd control measures. Uh, I, I struck that. I don't think uh, that uh, deployment should be made under those circumstances uh, as it may uh, agitate the situation. And, and in fact, I included language to, to indicate that. But uh, various uh, operational, procedural um, uh, paragraphs were put in there with respect to how uh, the patrol dog is utilized, what training aids and training 
uh, is uh, to be uh, deployed, what, um, you know, what is our response to outside agency canines when they come in, um, tracking and searches, et cetera. So hopefully, uh, committee members, you've had a chance to take a look at that review, and I'm here for any questions that you may have. Um, are there any um, questions or comments about the proposed pol proposed updated policy? I would just say if we were interested in crowd control, then we should have gotten a border collie instead of a belt. <laughs> yeah, we're oh. happy to take a border collie as well, uh, Alder Moore. Uh, Alder, I have uh, a question. Uh, yes, Mark. Um, uh, on the last page there where it was talking about um, that they're not to be requested to be used to apprehend anyone under the influence of drugs or alcohol, if no crime is committed or the mentally disturbed if no crime is involved. And I don't know how much canines are ever used for this anyway, but I just was trying to think through that paragraph. I guess if somebody was in some type of crisis or suicidal or maybe some person with dementia or something like that, or canine, would, would a canine be helpful in tracking a person like that, if they had walked into a, an area that they you were able to get a perimeter, um, or is that is that something that that might again agitate the system more if somebody would hear a dog barking or whatever like that? But I just I just could see somebody out that you're you're tracking on foot that that's needs some help. Would a, would a canine be helpful there, or at least allow the opportunity in a limited situation to be used uh, in yeah. that regard? I agree with you. I think uh, limited is the operative word uh, for tracking purposes. Uh, however, for uh, deployment um, of the dog for uh, apprehension or for um, similar means, I think is what the intent behind that policy is. So maybe some polish of the language there. So it wouldn't preclude using them for tracking or locating the... Correct, that is the, that is, Correct. It would that's, not preclude that. That's clear in the language. I mean, if, if it's misunderstood by uh, those of you who aren't cops and or former cops, I should say, <laughs> let me know what language you recommend me putting in there. But it's clear to me. Mark? Well, so I guess in my situation there would would how would that work then is if again it'd be very limited I was just trying to think of what other cases you might be used that for but let's say you did have somebody that you really needed to help for more not apprehend from a, for a crime how would how would that work then would the would the, the officer request the the uh, officer in charge approve something like that outside the policy because it just says the way I read it, it says it may not be requested to use, and unless your word, which I could agree with, apprehend, if that's the operative word there, I mean, we're not apprehending somebody in a crisis, we're not apprehending somebody that has dementia, dementia, we're trying to locate and help them. If apprehend means take into custody, then then it is very clear, I would agree with that, with you, that, it, that it's clear. But if, yeah. I'm, if I'm a patrol officer, and I need help with the dog, but that, when I first read that, I kind of thought, well, does that, is that really limited there? Right, I, I see what you, you, you mean. Yeah, we, we empower our OICs, our officers in charge, sort of to make that determination. And uh, I don't necessarily see this as limiting because our, our tracking policy or the, the language under our tracking policy does allow for sort of the community caretaker function. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's... Yeah, I mean, as, as long as that's, I mean, you see it that way too, that as long as it opens the door, I'm, I'm good with that. I, but I'm paying, trust me, I'll take all the help I get. So if you if you have recommended language in a certain area that that you think is more appropriate to add. Yeah. So uh, Chief, does it make sense if, if, there, if there is doubt about that part of the language about having Bill Cole take a look at it and see how as the attorney, he would interpret it in, in, an, in an enforcement case? I, I, I wonder what Bill Cole's going to ask me, what the intended purpose is behind it, if there's language that can be polished up. Um, I don't know 
I'm happy to refer to him. I just don't know if, if that's necessary, I guess is my point. Well, if you're comfortable, it's defensible, then I think we're comfortable. Yes, and now can I also preface by saying this, what I should have started with is that uh, I'm asking for the, uh, the approval of this for recommendation to council and ultimately council's approval um, because we do have a dog and handler in training. Uh, Common Council, for those of you who are not aware, uh, recently approved spending of ARPA funds for uh, a service called Lexapol uh, that is going to totally uh, take a look at all of our policies, consolidate policies, organize our policies, both police and fire. So I may very well be coming to you again with the updated canine policy. So this is my attempt to get this out in time and to be sufficient and comfortable enough um, before Lexapol gets a chance to, you know, give us their revamp version and, and we have to revisit this again. So, but I think that as it stands now, Mark, I'm not, I'm not saying you didn't make a good point there, but I, I, I do think that this is um, good enough language for us and me as chief to, to stand behind. Okay, sounds okay. good. Uh, Thank you. Is there a motion to recommend to the council? Larry? Yeah, I had a couple of questions uh, for the chief. Uh, what happens if the handler is sick or injured? Is, does that mean that the dog is out of service as well? Yes, as, as is the case now. Uh, and, or, I'm sorry, I should say previously under Maya. And I couldn't tell from the, the, the document, is there only one vehicle? In the department, it talked about a marked and an unmarked. Are there two vehicles that are suitable for transport of the animal or just one? We currently have, I, I'm trying to leave my, myself room for expansion of our canine program. We currently have one mark or one uh, unmarked squad. It used to be marked, but I, because the, the handler lived outside of our city limits, I wasn't comfortable with a fully marked Monona police squad traveling 10 miles outside of city limits to go home. Uh, so I've debadged that squad, but uh, for in the future, I want to be able to have the uh, able, uh, capability to have either a marked or an unmarked squad. But currently right now in service is an unmarked uh, uh, canine vehicle assigned to the handler and dog. Thank you. I have a question. I was, uh, this is Connie, I was wondering with this officer and the training and the handling um, and the current, would they be available, the, the number of hours? I'm wondering, you know, will this have an impact on this Connie, you're breaking up on my end. I'm not sure about everyone else's. I'm sorry. I'm wondering if with the additional training required and the responsibilities for this officer, uh, will this have an impact on the availability of that officer or the number of hours available for uh, Monona? Will it have an impact? Yes, uh, as it did when uh, Sergeant Knockreiner was uh, the handler for Maya. Uh, they, he, Sergeant or um, Officer Hoffman, who's our handler now, will get pulled away for a training. Uh, will uh, assist with mutual aid requests as we have utilized other agencies that come in in our city. Um, but I don't think that it is um, uh, it is going to have a negative impact on services here. In fact, um, by utilizing uh, a canine. Uh, patrol dog, we actually, in my opinion, enhance our services to our community. Thank you. And and it is, we are, we currently have this with a different handler and a different sure. um, dog. And so it's not, it's, it's a continuation rather than, than a new activity. It's just a, the policy that is being um, updated and written. Is that gotcha. correct, Chief? Yeah, the only difference is the, the, the canine position was previously held by a supervisor. That supervisor is now going full-time as a patrol supervisor, um, which 
I, I, I made that decision to not uh, uh, place another dog with a supervisor. Uh, that may change, but um, I saw benefit of, of putting that with a, a patrol officer position and then creating a specialty for that specific patrol officer. Uh, but he is working shift work. Um, you know, there's some uh, what we call canine or administrative time that's built in so that he can do things like, you know, attend to the dog or uh, whatnot. So, um, but uh, when he's here, he sort of counts in the, the patrol numbers, so to speak, and is available to uh, respond to calls for service as a regular patrol officer um, and is even able to do conveyances uh, based on how the, uh, the squad is set up with a half cage, if that makes sense to you. So we can put a prisoner in one half of the, the backseat of the squad car uh, and keep the kennel area separate so that he, he, the canine handler can be fully used as a patrol officer. So, and, and I will tell you that um, clearly the, our, our, our uniformed officers and the uniformed officers from all over Dane County are very supportive of the canine units. There was a breakfast at Christmas time um, that was actually done by the, the police department at, for the canine units run by the by the current, by the former canine officer and the new one with officers from all over. And if you went there, it was really um, heartwarming because there were police officers and their families from all over Dane County who came and had breakfast and supported the canine unit. And they do a lot because they raise a lot of volunteer funds to support the canine unit because it's an expensive effort that is that is paid for. I, I don't know if it's totally um, um, donations, but thousands and thousands of dollars for the dog, the training, the care um, of the canine unit. So it's clearly um, very important to the to all law enforcement people to have the canine units in the departments. That's, that's spot on. We would not be able to have this program, um, you know, uh, without the, the time and the financial support uh, provided by members of the community. And as Alder Thomas mentioned, it's, it's sort of the larger community that contributes, not just Monona. Uh, so thank you. We had someone this year, I think, donate $1,000 towards it, um, which was really very, very kind and generous. Um, so if you're ever looking, if you have a few extra bucks, you don't know what to do with it, you can always give it to the canine unit of the of the police department. We do photo um, ops too. We'll be on your Christmas card if you want. So um, is there a motion to recommend approval of the policy to the council? I'll make the motion. So who said? Mark. Mark, okay. Jim, do you want a second? Did I see your hand up? Yep, okay. Jim Bisbee, second. Um, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Post, motion carries. Thank you. Chief Cheney Austin, the police traffic dashboard. Yes, uh, I'll share my screen here in a second. Um, I just wanted to make sure uh, the committee is aware of uh, what will soon be made available to the public, our, um, our, our technology or our records management consortium um, analyst uh, provided a, a dashboard, a public facing dashboard that shows uh, some of our traffic data um, I frankly wish I would have had this day two um, because, of course, we get, we get a lot of uh, inquiries, requests, and concerns about uh, traffic enforcement. Um, and uh, this data, I think, is important to uh, demonstrate on a map um, sort of where our hazards are with respect to crashes, as well as uh, where we have dedicated some of our resources. Now, I see, can you see that? Okay, I see some head nods. Um, this will be made, made available to the public. Um, you got a lot of dots on the map right now. I'll try to break down some of them. 
the public will have the ability to toggle some of these on or off. Um, everything that looks black on your end, or if you have a high def screen, you'll see a star. The stars indicate crashes. And so when we get a lot of uh, sort of inquiries about, Chief, why aren't you spending a lot of time on some of these side rolls? Chief, why aren't you uh, having your crews really work uh, ticket enforcement or traffic enforcement or grant work? Um, you know, in some of our residential streets, why well, I first uh, say that we are, um, however, our focus is based on data, uh, and our data shows us that where the crashes are occurring, it's in our major thoroughfares, and it's, it's, it would be negligent of me to ignore what this data is showing. Um, often, uh, especially along the Beltline, we're also talking about uh, significant uh, injury uh, crashes as well. And our whole goal is to make sure uh, our community members are safe, persons passing through, uh, you know, commuting to work, et cetera, are safe. And so I as chief have to look at this data and look where all these stars are and focus some of my resources to address some of this behavior uh, and to try to curb uh, some of these crashes that are occurring. And this is why all of our Bureau of Transportation and Safety grants uh, you know, notwithstanding the fact that it's the state and they want it to go to sort of state highways and roads, that's understandable. Um, but it's also, they also see this data. Uh, every crash report we complete on a state document, obviously they get the record of. And I was just in a meeting earlier today talking about uh, racial disparities when it comes to crashes and fatal crashes. And that's one of the things that the Bureau of Transportation uh, uh, representative was talking about was why it's so important that we focus on where the what the data is showing us, um, and I think it's this this public facing dashboard is is a good way to represent that. Now, one of the things that I asked our analysts to uh, look into, which you don't see on here, are the many 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 dots of where we do what's called directed patrol, where officers who are assigned to do follow up based on a traffic complaint or are taking their own initiative to uh, address behaviors that they themselves saw, generate uh, police case numbers and actually do uh, uh, the high visibility patrols or stationary uh, uh, enforcement in areas. Uh, so this map does not reflect that. I think that what you'll find is that if we do incorporate that, you'll see some of the, the, the boots so to speak, uh, filled in with more dots and those dots being uh, directed patrol. I myself, had, since my start here, have generated at least a dozen directed patrol uh, within the residential area, particularly as it relates to our, our uh, crossing guard location here on Nichols and Maywood. And I know several officers have done very similar uh, work. So uh, this is something I, I, I think that uh, I will be sort of announcing to the public soon. I wanted public safety to sort of get, even though the public's involved in this, uh, first dibs uh, to see if there's any uh, feedback you can give me. Uh, our, our analyst works for uh, more than just Monona, and so it might be hard pressed to ask for more, um, but it, I, I'm certainly able to make an inquiry if there's a strong need for additional traffic data. So I'm, I'm here for questions, Alder and others. Questions or comments? I, I can only see, yep. I can't, you have to say your name, but, okay. Larry? Nancy had her hand up. Oh, Nancy. that's all right. Well, I was just gonna say, um, uh, Chief, I don't know if the other tabs there had it, but because the, there's a, such a pile up, uh, no puns intended, of uh, stars and, and other, uh, um, you know symbols i'm wondering if it would be helpful to have actually have like in parentheses in each one of those um like how many what the total is because it's hard to tell whether it's a thousand crashes or you know uh a hundred crashes because they're all piled up on each other so i Good point. I should make mention, which I didn't. You can scroll into this screen. Okay. And you're able to actually go down to the street. I just can't zoom out now. 
I'll have to back out of this. Okay. Um, you could also toggle the, the, the days ago. So I can go down to 14 days ago. Last year, this year, 90 days, 60 days. It won't, it'll give you some information, but it won't give you like, you know, this was a rear end crash. This is a, you know, injury crash. That is a lot of data that I don't think that we're, we're ready for right now. Um, but you can zoom in if that helps and it, and it reduces sort of the, um, the clog and cluster that you may have seen. Sure. I was just thinking like where it says accident and with a star, if it said how many, right? How many are on the chart and so, same thing with calls and same thing with citation. Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. At the very bottom, and I'm sorry, my internet connection slow here. There are these tabs down below where you see okay. my cursor is. Great. That I think so answers your question. Great. That's exactly what I was asking is whether it, it was reflected in other tabs. So that's helpful. Thank you. Yes. Let me back out of this. Chief. Yes. How many of those different dots are there and what's that time period that that display showed? I think I had it selected to last year. Let me let me double check. So if, if that's the case, that's all of 2021. Yes, that's all of 2021. And I'm look. It's hard with my shared screen here because I I also see the zoom. So let me. Let me I saw the numbers on the right. Yes. I can't add that quickly, even with my fingers and toes. Um, <laughs> but it's plenty. Yeah, so if I go back to the main dashboard here, there were, in, in 2021, there were 388 accidents. We've issued 1,028 citations for traffic. We've issued 745 warnings. There were 851 traffic stops conducted uh, by Monona officers. And there were 577 what we've categorized as a traffic complaint either uh, you know, resident or citizen generated or something that the officer has coded as. So that's yeah. somewhere over 3,000 roughly? If you tabulate all, all of those, yeah. yes. Just a, a little bit of history, as, as I look at the dashboard, and I look at the belt line. Um, some of you may recall that Monona had to fight long and hard because when they did the belt line, they did not want to build a new belt line. They wanted to put it where Broadway is. And, and actually where it not, I think probably for an accident that Chuck Wallace's wife was in turning off Broadway. I'm not sure that we would have I'm not sure that we would have had a new South Belt line. They were worried about Blanding's turtles. And we had meetings and, and it, it was probably one of the more contentious things in Monona. But I think about when I look at the, the strip where the Belt line is and where Broadway is and that, that was one road, how really bad and terrible it would be for Monona. So um, we're very fortunate that we won that one. Um, because, um, it, and, and of course we were proven right by it and it didn't hurt the environment, but, but it was a tough struggle for this community for probably about a year and people booed. I mean, it was, it was awful, um, but, but we prevailed against the, what, I, what some of us refer to as the West Side Madison, Madison people. <laughs> uh, Alder, if I may. Um, I think the chief, Chief McMullen and I uh, share significant concerns about the, um, the new lane, flex lane going in. Um, I, when I was traffic captain for Madison, I expressed concerns on behalf of the Madison Police Department. I'm told that folks here expressed concerns about that flex lane. 
Uh, it's, it's a done deal, so we're gonna have to adapt, but uh, our job is dangerous enough uh, when we have to close down traffic. Um, it, this, this makes very little space for folks to, uh, especially first responders to stop or for disabled motorists, uh, as in the, the vehicles disabled, folks that run out of gas. It, 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 and I know the state is, is going to monitor that flex lane and they're gonna you know, shut it down as needed, but that's gonna be reactive probably most of the time. And then I'm not sure, and, and I mean this with all due respect and probably being a jaded cop for 20 years, I'm not sure we have a, 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 a good enough sort of, uh, I, sh I should probably just can not say it, but I'm not sure folks are gonna be uh, sort of equipped to adapt to this flex lane uh, in time. So there is an educational component that the state's gonna roll out. Uh, Lieutenant Weigel is our sort of liaison to uh, the state for this uh, rollout process, the educational process. Uh, it's my understanding that my predecessor and Lieutenant Weigel have relayed to the state that we don't have the resources to dedicate for enforcement and education of that flex lane, you know, for months on end. Um, so I, I mean, I have general concerns. It's scary enough as it is. And, and now we're adding another uh, lane of travel that's going to make it even more challenging for uh, motorists who are involved in crashes that either can't move or don't move, because we've seen both, um, or for public safety when we're trying to work out there. And I don't know if Chief McFarland, you have anything else? I, I think you hit the bulk of it. We. Uh... Uh, the, the media you see talks about all the, the, the fire EMS and police departments are in support of the police lane. Uh, none of those actually have real estate on the belt line. Uh, I've talked to every single first responder agency that goes from Agriculture Drive all the way up through Middleton. Nobody is in support of this from Dane County Sheriff to Madison PD, Madison Fire, all of us. We've all spoke against it, but uh, it's a done deal. Uh, but pushed, I, who pushed it? I'm not sure. I'm, yeah, I'm not sure who has the money behind the push here uh, for the $45 million uh, that was spent on this. But uh, as Chief Cheney Austin said, we have to deal with it as it is. Uh, it's going to happen. Um, we've already had some experience with um, the narrowed lanes as it is. And what it really boils down to is we're going to take two thirds of the belt line instead of a third of the belt line when it comes to traffic incidents or disabled vehicles. So instead of one lane being shut down, it'll be two, uh, just to provide a safe work zone for our staff. So it'll create some pretty heavy backups, but I agree with uh, Chief Cheney Austin's uh, idea of whether people are gonna be able to adapt to the flex lane or not. And, uh, and, and I'll leave it at that. Any other questions or comments? Alder Moore? No. Okay. Um, well, keep us posted and let us know what we can do to help promote this, Chief. Thank you. Um, okay, next item, discussion of future agenda items. Chief McMullen. Can I go back to agenda item D? I think it got skipped. Oh. What did I skip? Oh, uh, full-time hiring process. Sorry. So just a little backstory. One of my full-time members uh, was uh, absconded with uh, by City of Madison. Uh, they accepted a job offer with City of Madison Fire Department effective February 1st. I also lost a volunteer in this hiring process, which uh, disappoints me on both counts. Um, but uh, Happy to see them move to, to where they want to be and happy to support them in that. Um, just wanted to give a heads up that Joe will probably be in contact over the next week or two. We're probably going to do an internal process. Uh, we have three or four folks that are already on the department, either in a volunteer or LTE status uh, that meet the criteria. Uh, I've been working on revamping the job descriptions anyway. So as soon as I get those back and in and, and place, I'll reach out to you and set up a time for the PFC to meet and find out uh, what the process is. This is new for me. So uh, uh, the LTE hiring process, 
right now I'm bringing on another LTE. I've brought on a few since I started, but I'm just to give you a heads up, I'll be bringing on another LTE casual, uh, probably middle of this month to get her active by March 1st. Um, and she will actually likely be one of our internal candidates as well. Uh, so we have, uh, by my count, uh, six internal candidates that meet the, the uh, new job description. Uh, of those, I figure we'll have three apply. So we'll, uh, if, if, as long as the PFC is amenable to it, we'll do an internal process and uh, do a lateral transfer or promotion from a volunteer LTE up to the, that full-time position with the uh, hope to get it in place by April 1st. That's my, that's my goal anyway. And the moderate amount of time I've been on PFC, that's a little bit different scenario than what's come before us. So maybe some of the other commission members who have been on there longer can help give some guidance. So I will reach out over the next couple of weeks. Uh, I started with HR to make sure we have all of our ducks in a row to, as, a, as a city standpoint uh, to do an internal only hire. Um, but as soon as I have all those ducks in a row, I'll reach out to PFC and uh, set up a meeting in February to uh, see what role the PFC would like to play in this. Uh, again, this is new to me as well. So, Chief, do we do we ever have interns who are, there's a local young man who's just started training to be an EMT. Do we ever have interns? We, we do not at this point. I'm building an intern program for after we have the new public safety building in place. Um, I, I'm very familiar with intern programs. Uh, I, I was with Deer Grove many years ago and we had one fabulous program. You get a lot of uh, um, what I call uh, cheap coverage out of the, the interns while they're learning and going to school. And uh, it, it's a benefit to the city and to, and to the employee. Uh, but until we get a new public safety building, I won't uh, subject an intern to live in the conditions that we have in the, in the building. So. Uh, but we are in the process of building one for once we have a new public safety building. Thank you. Are there any questions of the chief or comments? Okay. Sorry, I skipped that one, chief. Thank you for catching it. Um, discussion of future agenda items. Are there any agenda items? I mean, the chiefs do the agendas mostly, and sometimes I suggest things, but are there any items that any of you think we should be covering that we're not or that you'd like us to? Feel free at any time to, um, the chiefs actually do the agendas. So if you have thoughts, of, if something comes up and you want a discussion on something um, to let us know and we will add it to the agenda. And we will move on to reports and we will start. I don't know who made this list up, but the fire department's first. <laughs> first of all, I will not take credit for any of the agenda. Uh, Chief Cheney Austin deals with that. I'm happy to take suggestions and pass on to him. I, I'm a good middleman. Um, but you're also, I will first of all, extend the, the invite to any of you to stop down to the fire station and talk to me directly. If you've got any questions on any of the stuff we're doing down there any of the public safety building stuff, any of the, the way we're dealing with volunteers or LTE staff or full-time staff, I welcome anybody to come in. Um, as Alder Thomas and Alder Moore know, I'm, I'm pretty transparent. Um, I, I do my best to, to share far and wide what we're doing down at the fire department. So I, I, I extend that to anybody. You're welcome to come by and, and sit down and have a chat um, anytime you like. As long as I'm there, I might not be there. But if I am, I'm happy to talk. So uh, I've got just a few things. Um, public safety building, the, the, the site survey, the site uh, RFP is moving forward. Myself and Chief Cheney Austin met along with uh, uh, Assistant Chief Eckloff and uh, Assistant Chief, I like saying that, Assistant Chief Duman. Uh, uh, met with them this afternoon and this morning uh, to answer some questions. And, and I think that's moving forward pretty nicely. Um, was able to attend, I was up in Duluth last weekend and last week, uh, which was very, very cold. Uh, not quite sure who decides to have a conference in Duluth the end of January, uh, but was up there and I was able to attend four uh, sessions on diversity, equity, and inclusivity, which were actually very well uh, put together. Uh, one of the things that I like to highlight with my department is 
right now, I think we're at a 28% um, female to male ratio, which for a combination or volunteer department is, is enormous. Uh, I believe Madison runs at about a 36% uh, female to male ratio on the fire department. And we're at 28%. So for a volunteer combination department, we're doing really well. I have six new applicants, even after the 12 that I brought on over the last two months, I have six more. Uh, and three of those are female. And um, so we're actually going to be sitting closer to a, a 33 or 34% mix once we bring those new folks on, uh, which I think is just fantastic. Um, I. I try each month to, to, to highlight my volunteers. My volunteers do a fantastic job. Um, the amount of hours that they put in last year, we're talking 8,500 to 10,000 hours just in training alone of time that they spent at the station, at conferences, at state sanctioned trainings. Um, all the stuff they do on a, on a daily basis uh, is just, uh, for as many years as I've been a volunteer, it's just fantastic to see that uh, for all of the national issues with volunteers, we don't really have that problem in, in Monona. We've got, we brought on 12 new volunteers, nine of which are in our entry-level class going at Monona right now, started uh, two weeks ago Thursday. They're all doing well. They're very involved. We already have them on the trucks. Um, they're pulling shifts down at the station. They're, they're very engaged, which I think is fantastic. Um, I am working on an annual report. You guys will get to see the first whack at that before it goes to the council and the uh, and, and beyond. Uh, so we're working on an annual report. And part of what Chief Cheney Austin just did is, is fantastic because we're, we're actually working on a, a live heat map for the fire department and EMS responses as well. So you can kind of see where we respond, uh, the generic type of calls that we respond to. So it'll be overdoses, seizures, falls, that sort of thing. No specific addresses. But it gives you an idea where the hot spots are in the city, uh, where we go frequently. It's easy anecdotally to say, yeah, we're always at XYZ address, but it's a different thing to be able to plot down on a map and show you that 25% of our calls are in this area of the city. Uh, and these are the type of calls that we respond to. So that'll be built in part of the annual report as well. But I'm working on a live heat map that any of the council members or any of our public safety committee partners can log into and see uh, a stripped down version of that on a day-to-day -day basis. If you're really interested or really bored and have nothing better to do and want to log in and see uh, what your police and fire and EMS departments are doing. Sorry, I didn't mean to mention police chief, uh, but uh, but on a regular basis to be able to log in and see what we do and, and where our, our uh, resources are being spent at. Uh, I think that's a valuable tool for our um, our not only our public safety members, but also our constituents and our citizens to be able to see that our resources are being used. So when I come back and say, hey, we need more resources, it's out there in the public why we need more resources because you can see for yourself where they're being used at. So that will go live hopefully April. There's some programming issues I'm working on right now, um, but about the same time, uh, the, annu the annual report should be out for our March meeting. Uh, for everybody to take a look at before we push, push it out to the council. Um, so with that, that's all I've got and I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. I, I just have a comment and that is um, you and um, I, the, the other members of the department deserve a lot of credit for recruiting the people because those of us, um, others of us who are at the table who were here before you recall what we used to hear is we can't get volunteers. And so um, we are delighted and excited and you get a lot of credit. I know the volunteers and the other firefighters have encouraged their friends and others, but, but your methods for doing this and your leadership um, have just turned this around incredibly. So thank you. Well, thank you. Again, I can't do it without the support of everybody, which I think is fantastic. But to give you an idea, so we just brought on 12 people, most of which didn't have any training, about half of which live in the city, which is fantastic. We'll give them the training. They're, they're having a blast. They, they started January 1st. We put them out in the ice and the water uh, the two weeks in January for ice rescue training. They absolutely loved it. Uh, but we're attracting people that are trained as well. So I have a young lady who just applied her applications in front of me. I'll go to the board of directors next week. Um, works full-time for, for a fire department east of here. 
uh, but is moving to Monona in February and said, any, any day that I'm not at my fire department, I'll be at your fire department helping and wants to be a volunteer for us. Um, fully trained, several years of experience. I have another individual that just provided an application tonight uh, while we were in this meeting, provided it along with the certifications. He has eight years of experience. He's fully certified. He's moving to Monona, wants to volunteer with us. So we're not just getting folks that aren't trained. We're also getting folks that, that actually are active firefighters and active EMTs that are moving here that are like, this is pretty cool. Uh, most of uh, the, the newer folks we're getting, uh, what we're hearing when I ask them, why Monona? Why are you coming to us? Um, out of all the places you can, we are the only place in Metro Madison that you can actually come volunteer at. So I'm hearing that a lot. We were getting a couple of UW students uh, this time around that are here for the next five years doing master studies and, and that sort of thing. So we'll have them for several years. Um, and I hope that when they leave here, they leave with a uh, idea that their volunteering extends to the next place they go. Uh, they have such a good experience here that no matter where they end up, they end up in a place where they volunteer. So um, I'm, we, I'm having we'll, a blast. We, we, we will have to, um, there are some people who do some really good interviews on WVMO and it would be interesting to interview some of the recruits who, who have moved here and who are volunteering here and talk about what and why and um, create enthusiasm. And the public should know that, that you know, how successful and, and how interested it will all help when we talk about actually borrowing the money to do the public safety building. That's a fantastic idea. Um, and I actually already have a few that would be well in hand to do that. So I think I will, uh, I will reach out to uh, Will and we'll get that set up. Great idea. Thank you. Um, any questions of the chief? If not, we will move to the police department. Chief Cheney Austin. Thank you, Alder. I'll just say that uh, Chief McMullen has almost convinced me to volunteer for the police or for the fire department. So uh, not quite, but you're almost there, Jerry. Uh, it's been uh, hats off to our crew, our public safety team, firefighter EMS, but also, of course, our, our dispatchers and police, as I've mentioned before, uh, the officers in particular risk their lives every day for folks they don't know and they do so safely. And they do, do so with professionalism and courage. And uh, I, too, would like to commend our, our rank and file for the work that they're doing. Um, I, I made a list here to try to keep me somewhat within decent time. Um, our uh, new three new employees are doing well, uh, happy to report. Uh, Emma the cop uh, is at Blackhawk Tech, her, her second week there. Uh, Emma the dispatcher, who goes by Sal, is doing quite well. She's taking your calls today and is dispatching uh, in, in training. Uh, and then uh, Officer Rivero is out in the streets uh, field training and doing quite well. Um, we will be starting a uh, team here, sort of on an as-needed part-time basis of uh, sworn staff. And the team is called Community Response Team. Uh, very similar to my uh, previous job at the Madison Police Department that had dedicated community policing teams. Uh, we obviously don't have the resources, but we have the need uh, in which we need a team that's going to be uh, able to be uh, proactive, receptive to needs, uh, assist with certain investigations, uh, help out with uh, you know problem solving for traffic issues and other issues in our community, and frankly be available to assist uh, uh, as needed um, uh, in, in fulfilling our mission. Um, and so that community response team will get together. Uh, it's, we're still in sort of the uh, selection process internally, uh, but we will uh, get a, a, a group of very uh, skilled officers and, and detectives together here soon. And uh, that'll be another resource that uh, we will uh, have and deploy here at uh, your police department. Uh, so keep your, your eyes out for that. Um, so community engagement is, is alive and well, as I've mentioned in, in previous meetings and in council, uh, that is a requirement of mine uh, this year that each staff member participates in a community engagement activity each quarter. And we will provide the the time uh, and or resources uh, in order for that to occur. Uh, one per quarter is a minimum, but uh, obviously we're encouraging more community engagement uh, opportunities. 
And so staff has already been uh, participating in, in, in some, which is great. Um, our peer support pr uh, program and our peer support officers alive and well, we'll be connecting with the Chief McMullen here uh, in the coming weeks uh, to make sure that uh, they um, uh, are, are, are supported in whatever initiatives or in their endeavors that, that we have here with respect to peer support. Um, our officer is already connected with our EAP provider and has disseminated information, and, and that's great. That, that's what I like to see. Um, we've uh, established a commendation and, uh, for both employees and non-employees, a, a recognition um, a program for uh, personnel, and again, as I said, non-personnel, um, and that is a very user-friendly recognition uh, uh, form that we've, we've filled out, so we're those are starting to uh, stream in right now and at some point fire and, and, and police will get together and we'll, we'll work out a formal awards banquet or ceremony. You can give more formal recognition uh, uh, by way of a plaque or medal or certificate to those members that uh, uh, have, have gone above and beyond in serving our community, including members of the public. Um, we have two squads, one of which is sitting in the parking lot of City Hall right now, the other has been tucked away so it doesn't freeze to death, but um, we're waiting on parts, um, equipment, um, due to the backlog of, of, of uh, supply, um, blamed on a variety of things, but um, those cars were ordered mid to early of last year. We got them late last year, uh, and the equipment still hasn't gotten here altogether yet. So um, we have two hybrid Ford Explorers that are waiting to be deployed. Uh, and we try to brush them off and drive them so that they're uh, functional by the time we do get the rest of the equipment in. But uh, we're sort of brainstorming this year what we can do differently, anticipating that this isn't going to go away. Uh, everything that I'm reading in fleet magazines, et cetera, says this is probably like a three, five year issue that we're seeing right now. Um, and so just trying to think outside the box and using our internal brain power here with Sarah, Kurt and others uh, to think about um, uh, how to avoid this moving forward. But in case you've seen a squad car with snow out front, uh, that's our brand new squad that you wonderful folks have paid for that we're just waiting on some parts uh, to get that uh, deployed. Um, and I mentioned Lexapol. Uh, thank you uh, for your support, uh, this committee. Uh, thanks to Common Council, of course, for all, ultimate uh, authorization. Uh, that'll help Chief McMullen uh, and I tremendously, but it'll help provide uh, better public safety uh, to our community and making sure that we have good sound policy in place, organized policy in place and something that's more accessible to the public. So uh, we've, Jerry, the chief and I have already started to interact with our uh, counterparts uh, with the Lexapol organization and we have orientation sessions that we have to attend and uh, some implementation that'll be done here uh, within the next few weeks. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I neglected to include uh, on the agenda what I've been told needs to be included is a standing agenda item related to DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I apologize. I will make sure that I include that uh, for future agenda items because I, I do think that that's an important topic to discuss any initiatives, questions, or um, uh, any other processes that we could put forth with respect to DEI here at Minola. So, and that's all I have, Alder. Does anybody have any questions of the chief? Comments? Joe, do you want to do you have anything to report from the police and fire commission? Uh, just to pull some threads together, we've touched on already in this meeting. Uh, PFC met in early January, right after the new year. Uh, we're very pleased to appoint an assistant police chief um, and also put uh, what Chief referred to as Emma of the Cop uh, back on the list so she can go through the academy again. Um, and I know it was sort of a failure right at the end there that I think we can do right again this time. So the commission was happy to do that as well. And sounds like we'll be meeting in February. Any questions? Okay. Do any of the... Um committee members have questions or comments about anything? I can if comment about the PAC again, but you don't want me to do that. I'm sorry, Jim. You can come, I can comment about the PAC again, but that's just bringing up a sore subject. You said about anything. 
Well, there you go. <laughs> Asking you'll receive. So um, the next meeting is February 23rd. Joe, did you have your hand up? No, I was just scratching my head, sorry. Oh, Bad timing. <laughs> you were thinking, I bet, okay. Um, the next meeting is February 23rd and the next item on the agenda is a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stay warm and we'll see you in February. <laughs>